Alex Mose, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle to fight back and win against big tech monopolies. First topic is around something we've 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 got a couple public platform stocks uh, in Plat, um, like uh, Poshmark and ThreadUp. It's all about these secondhand kind of secondhand resale marketplaces. There's a flurry of activity around what's going on. And I think what's interesting is you're starting to see the convergence where the marketplaces, the the kind of business model in general has gotten enough validation, enough traction, both with consumers as well as striking a kind of environmental um, and sustainability cord with with consumers with investors and just kind of and 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 with uh you know business executives that now the largest brands in the world are really embracing this uh and bringing it into their fundamental kind of operating mantra and that's a very big strategic step forward i think for the advancement of these secondhand marketplaces we've covered them for years and we've got a bunch of examples of just just in the past few weeks, the kind of activity we've seen in this space with COVID hitting, you know, almost what, 18 months ago now, we had actually used some of the like sneaker resale, secondhand kind of sneaker marketplaces as examples of, you know, they're private. So they would talk about um, how well their sales were doing even though it, it didn't, you wouldn't really expect like a goat or a stock X to be surging in summer of 2020, but they were. And we then, you know, s- suggested that you'd see a similar result in the earnings from the public platforms like a Poshmark. And we saw that even throughout COVID, not only have these platforms survived, they've thrived. Even Thread Up, which was a somewhat distant number two, um, is making a lot of waves now, right? So it's not just where your number one is is ultra dominant, and and the number two is you know a a much smaller version of of the number one player. There's actually plenty of room for just you know for even the top two and now more niche players. So what some might have thought as a as a whole industry being considered niche, I think you're starting to see basically um, what was considered niche becoming an entire industry of its own, call it secondhand and resale as its own industry with your large mega kind of horizontal players that go across multiple categories of, of clothing and fashion and products. And then you have niches within that. So it's really interesting where kind of this idea of used and secondhand and new are now two different industries. And if you are a brand, if you are a manufacturer, what are you doing, right? How are you operating in that? So really interesting space. Let's look at some examples. First one here is going to be here from Adidas. It's called this uh, Choose to Give Back, a resale program powered by thread up this is genius i love this so much this reminds me of what amazon did back in the early 2000s where they were powering bestbuy.com yeah no true story that actually amazon powering bestbuy.com was how they kind of got the inside track to to really then launch their own kind of direct B2C marketplace prowess because they could see the challenges inside the belly of the beast of Best Buy and others. Not exactly the same story because Amazon didn't have a lot of scale on its own right before working with Best Buy, but still, you know, this kind of deep enterprise integration is actually a very powerful strategic move that I love thread up really trailblazing this. So it's really great. And, and the whole ethos, the why Adidas wants to do it is saying, hey, you, we want to help you end plastic waste. You can obviously resell Adidas, but they're saying that you can, you can put any brand through this program because that's the power of the marketplace because this is from thread up as opposed to 
and Adidas only play, you, you know, then you can only send in Adidas uh, clothing to the program. Well, that kind of like doesn't match with the whole mantra of sustainability and, and reducing plastic waste, right? So because you have the marketplace integration, you can now take any brand, but Adidas gets to bring this forward with their consumers and, and, and you know, kind of leverage that scale and close that cycle. So that's really cool. Another example, platform powering Lululemon for Lululemon resale called Trove, valued at over $200 million, raises $77 million, right? So now you have smaller companies, much smaller than a thread up, a Poshmark, Trove here, um, powering Lululemon and other brands, and you know that helping them raise more capital, right? So that's one that's one vertical of this. Hey, can I can I power these large brand resale programs as a channel to get scale, right? Versus then having your own marketplace versus other niches, which I'm about to get to. Let's look at this one. Here's another. This is now an example of a niche. You have Goat, one of the top two kind of like sneaker, um, you know, resale platforms. Now, the interesting thing about Goat and StockX are that, yeah, it's resale, but mostly it's new resale. The whole point is that you can't get these sneakers. They're rare and exclusive. So, they're selling above the retail price, but you're buying a new sneaker, but technically it's a resale. You know, you just can't get access to the inventory. And that's why there's this resale function versus secondhand, um, which is, you know, legitimately used. Not saying you can't buy used stuff on those platforms, but that's kind of the primary core transaction. It's resale, but it's new. And now Goat and Gucci and the CEO of Gucci are investing in, this is also resale, in Grailed, which is for streetwear, this is from mid-September, they got $60 million funding round led by a competitor, Goat, uh, and you have the CEO of Gucci in there and, right? Like, what? The competitor is leading the fun round, you know, the, the fundraise. But now you can see these niches, right? You can see this is its own industry. This isn't a niche within the clothing. This is its own industry. Look at this. This is also an article from September. As resale booms, eBay is doubling down on refurbished and recycled products. Article goes on and on and on talking about refurbished and recycled products helped drive a 400% increase in used consumer products on eBay since 2018. Uh, this is the UK chief. We've talked about Etsy's. Acquisition of Depop, a brilliant acquisition. Vinted is the other large player in Europe. This article is saying the resale economy is estimated to grow to $77 billion by 2025. Uh, that's a number from ThreadUp, right? I mean, so this is massive. This is massive, massive stuff. Yeah, real, real. I haven't even talked about real, real. Um, investor, in this is also from mid-September, all this. Investor interest in secondhand retailers like the Real Real and ThreadUp continue to rise as sales expand. Uh, see here, this secondhand clothing item had an 82% smaller carbon footprint. That's that's striking the ESG cord, which is which is big from a from investors looking to put money into ESG friendly companies and indices. That's big. This is huge growth. And then there's a bunch of other smaller ones that I haven't even listed. Smaller startups. Curtsy uh, for Gen Z women raised $11 million. Vinted, I spoke about raising $300 million. You know, this one list, Bestier Collective, we've spoken about that in the show, uh, on the show in the past, right? It's just, this isn't the dawn of a new industry. This is a new industry, which these founders have been talking about this. That's what we've been covering this on the show for years. Uh, but now I think the media at large and um, certainly some of the, you know, leaders at, at large brands are realizing it begs the question. And we've, we've actually asked this in the past, right? What's Nike doing, right? Like where's Nike in all of this? I see Lululemon. I see, um, Adidas, I see Gucci and, 
um, their broader Artemis group making tons of moves that we've cataloged on the show. What's Nike up to? Remember, we've talked about Nike's new CEO, this guy named John Donahue, Donahoe. You want to know what his, what his job was uh, before this? Is in 2005, John was hired as president of eBay Marketplaces. Hmm. And then in 2008, he was appointed CEO of eBay. The former CEO of eBay is now the CEO of Nike since January of 2020, mind you. He's had some time under his belt. Chairman of PayPal, guy understands platforms. Guy understands platforms. What's Nike doing? Where is Nike? All this stuff, this is going on for years. What's Nike doing? Very bizarre. Very bizarre. Maybe they're just too big for their own britches, you know? They can't recognize that rather than, you know, what happened to them on Amazon, you know, they were working with Amazon, then they pulled their stuff from Amazon, then they said, you know, we only want to distribute this ourselves. How did they lean in and start to look at partnering with and taking a stake in one or multiple of these marketplaces in the secondhand resale space? Otherwise, you're going to be where you are with Amazon today, which is, you know, they've become the giant. You don't have a strategic play and you kind of retrench to your own distribution, which is not small. But also, where is the environmental? Or where, is the, where is all of that from Nike saying, hey, we, we should really look at, look at the impact we could have on the world, on sustainability, if they were to embrace this more aggressively and make moves and really lead the industry. They're not leading, following. All righty. Next topic. Government actually successfully making an impact to rein in tech monopoly power. Unfortunately, it's not the U.S. government. And I'm not talking about the Chinese government, which knows fully well how to rein in uh, tech monopoly uh, challengers to their power. Um, instead, I'm actually talking about Australia and a country in Africa uh, which we've covered before on the show and we'll talk about now more detail. But first, let's go to uh, Australia, continent number one. And I actually was on Bloomberg talking about this at the time, how the Australian government's law to level the playing field with media companies and Google and Facebook was A, a phenomenal move by the Australian government, B, uh, you had Google and Facebook soft threatening to leave the country. And I predicted correctly that Sundar did not have the gumption to follow through on that threat. And I was proved correct with Google capitulating and then Facebook following. If Google capitulates, Facebook can't, you know, can't, can't allow Google to be the only, you know, platform player in, in the news, in news or, you know, in the continent of Australia and country of Australia. They were lobbying aggressively. They were making threats. It was brinkmanship to the finest degree. And the Australian government stuck to its guns and it worked. And it brought both Google and Facebook to the negotiating table to pay the media companies um, something of a fair wage, whereas what they were paying before was basically nothing. It worked, right? Government intervention, uh, holding the tech monopolies accountable. It worked. Facebook and Google are now paying these media companies. There's some quibbling here. So this article is about Facebook wraps up deals with Australian media firms. And then one of this, this TV broadcaster is complaining that they didn't get Facebook money, but they did get Google money. This is one of, I guess, the top five TV broadcasters in Australia. It looks like they have um, some of the like international, you know, like foreign language coverage, uh, special broadcasting service, one of Australia's five national free 
free to air broadcaster is the country's main source of foreign language news, right? So like in the US, you know, I, I would imagine this is like, like a Univision or something like that, right? Anyway, so they said, well, Facebook declined to enter negotiations despite months of attempts and they're bummed that they didn't get Facebook money. But it did get Google money. So, I mean, okay, like you wouldn't have gotten any money, SPS, had it not been for this government law. And that means that the other four broadcasters did all get money. And probably some of the large media companies that maybe don't have a, you know, a TV broadcasting uh, presence also. So um, the deals have concluded in summation, right? Like Google and Facebook came to the table and they're paying these firms much more money than the firms would have made prior. I'd say that's a win. Put it in the column of big tech monopolies. Well, they've scored some other points, but in this scenario, big government gets the win, big tech monopolies are paying for it. That's a, that's a win, gang. We'll take it. Um, now, yes, okay, this article says that some smaller publishers have been left out in the cold. Uh, raising questions about the scope and effectiveness of the groundbreaking law. Okay. Hold on, Reuters. Okay. Pump your brakes here. This is step one. But now, you know, doesn't mean that the law can't be expanded. Governments love to, you know, change laws and grab more power for themselves. Um, doesn't mean that more smaller independent publishers could be included in a future iteration of this. But the point is, this is working. And this is now showing a recipe for Australia and the world about, you know, now yet another mechanism to help level this playing field against big tech. And sure, okay, they didn't get it the first time around. It's never going to be perfect. But I'd say, for the most part, this worked pretty darn well. It accomplished pretty much what they were trying to do. Sure, there's some, you know, people that aren't happy on, you know, on the periphery of this. But hey, this is a win. Only a handful of independent smaller publishers have reached deals. So it's not even that none of them reach deals, only a handful of them. So you're still getting some of the smaller publishers getting deals. This is phenomenal. <laughs> now everyone's just quibbling like this one. Other rejected publishers include The, Con the Conversation, which publishes, publishes public affairs commentary by academics. Yeah. Maybe you can see why they didn't get any money. I don't know who's reading that one. That that sounds like a real page turner. This prompted a rebuke from the regulator which drafted the law. Um, uh, it's hilarious, right? Like, unfortunately, the uh, smaller publication that publishes public affairs commentary by academics, those are like university professors, didn't get their money. Oh, the horror. So that's one example. That's Facebook and really Google coming to the table, paying dollars um, in Australia. Now let's go to what country in Africa? Nigeria. Now there's a bunch of irony with how this came about. And there's, there is definitely a, this is a double-edged sword, which I'm going to get to. But um, the good news is that this isn't done, but this is actually, I actually love how they're handling this. Twitter ban in Nigeria to be lifted if the platform sets up a local office and pays taxes. I mean, it's awesome. I think the government is trying to set up their own like Twitter alternative, uh, which we've talked about before on the show. And he announced this on their 61st Independence Day anniversary. So just, you know, really striking those nationalism chords. He acknowledged the fact that Twitter is used to disseminate information. So he warned about bad actors who misuse the platform uh, to execute criminal activities, propagate fake news and promote ethnic and religious sentiments. You know, they took the high ground. They said, OK, well, Twitter is is banning officials. I think they silenced the Nigerian president off the platform. And that really was the, <laughs> the last straw. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. back. Um, and uh, so they said, okay, well, we're just going to shut you down, Twitter. And sure enough, Twitter came. Where? Oh, yeah, that's right. They came to the table because uh, they want that traffic and they want to sell those ads. So they've got the leverage. They've got the high ground. And now they're saying, okay, here are the terms. You got to pay taxes. You got to set up a local office, right? You need to get involved in the country and have a presence, which is going to bring jobs. I'm going to pay taxes to the government. 
Phenomenal example of what? Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. Protectionism. Uh, talked on the show for years about how China has used is a textbook example of using protectionism to incubate and foster its own tech community. Right. Keep U.S. big tech out, create a vacuum, allow for local uh, tech companies to to, you know, to get a start to now become large Chinese tech monopolies that have actually become so big. The Chinese government needs to regulate and censor them. But still, that's a great problem to have. Much better problem than to have foreign U.S. tech companies in there that you, you know, struggle to uh, contain or, or regulate. Uh, much more difficult. So instead, Nigeria isn't really able to do the exact same thing, but they are doing their own version of that, right? At the very least, they're going to be able to get much more cooperation out of Twitter. They're going to be able to get, which which means, should mean less censorship, hopefully, right? Um, or maybe for the Nigerian president, looking at this cynically is to say the kind of censorship that the Nigerian president wants and not, you know, uh, uh, what Twitter wants. It'll probably be somewhere in between. But uh, Nigeria is also going to get money out of Twitter, jobs out of Twitter. And I think it's not in this article, but I'm pretty sure there is also a Twitter alternative that had its traffic spike and, you know, saw uh, a much more adoption now because Twitter is still banned in the country for um, since June 5th. So, yeah, I love this approach, you know. Um, these platforms, even though, yes, this is a U.S. company, they have violated the very ethos of what it means to be a platform. The level of content censorship that is happening every day, and it's increasing every day, it's not going away, uh, on these content platforms like a Twitter, a Facebook, Google, etc., is completely unacceptable and goes against the very grain of what it means to be a platform. And they continue to violate it and just do more of it. So I don't see it changing unless you take drastic action. And that's actually the role of government to stand up to these monopolistic companies. Uh, so I love this. Now, what is the, what, what is the double-edged sword on this? Yeah, um, Nigeria is using Chinese technology to enforce the ban of Twitter. Yeah, yeah not so good, um, right? We've talked about how China Belt and Road you know, initiative is exporting their protectionism technology, right? Like the, the great firewall tech that lets you shut down websites and, and censor content and, you know, what domains your people can go to. Yeah. Nigeria is using that. So yeah, it's not perfect. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I still love, I, I, I you still got to love how they're approaching the whole situation. Next topic. Talked about a few of these, <clears throat> a few of these examples before on the show, but I published this post with Wisdom Tree's uh, head of research recently on the Wisdom Tree blog, and the title being the next Famga. Uh, Famga being Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, uh, the five largest, pretty sure five largest companies by market cap, certainly five largest tech monopolies uh, in the country, and. Mostly the world, I can, I, you know, we've got to see where the Chinese are, but yeah, probably the world. And so the, the beginning of the article talks about how FAMGA has used M&A very effectively over the past really decade to accelerate their growth, right? We talk about this kind of rise from being a, having a dominant platform in one platform type or one platform space and then becoming a platform conglomerate. I've talked about Uber um, in in that vein, in many in many respects, ride sharing got pummeled because of COVID. But then Uber Eats was able to buoy the company in many ways that where where Lyft just didn't have that ability. They just didn't have that platform conglomerate status. And you can see now the synergies that are shared to cross pollinate these two audiences uh, between the two different platform models. So I talk about some classic examples of that at the head of the article here, right? Like Google buying YouTube. Google had Google video way back when, but YouTube was blowing up. They bought YouTube for a billion dollars. Amazing acquisition. Um, and then we're able to supercharge YouTube uh, with, you know, that the, the, the existing audience of, of Google users 
and make sure that YouTube was the de facto platform monopoly in this you know, video uh, user generated content space. There's a bunch of examples of this, but now there's a bunch of examples of uh, large tech monopoly M&A from FAMGA coming under great scrutiny by who? Uh, the DOJ and other regulatory agencies in the United States, which is phenomenal. And it's absolutely having an impact on the decision making at the executives at these large tech monopolies. I know this from personal experience, not to mention some public examples of it, which I also talk about uh, Facebook's tiny $400 million acquisition of Giphy is coming under fire. That might not even go through, let alone much larger deals being just not even not even going through with the deal because you know how much scrutiny you're going to come under. And if you do go through the deal, it's going to take forever to get approved, which allows other competitors to make move make moves um, while you're waiting for the deal to close. Could mean that when you're negotiating to buy a company, you have large uh, breakup fees. That was actually the reason why Amazon was able to buy Twitch instead of Google buying Twitch was really um, a difference of opinion on the breakup fee because there was a lot of fear that Google bought Twitch that would get struck down. So the company Twitch wants a breakup fee, right? Hey, if this deal doesn't go through, if the FTC, if the DOJ breaks this up, like I want a penalty because I could have sold to Amazon and that deal would have closed, right? So I could be here in a year, deal doesn't close. Now what do I do? So breakup fees as a deal point is also a big sticking factor and can blow up the deal from even going through. That's just one of a few examples where you're now seeing a real impact of the antitrust scrutiny on big tech's ability to put forth uh, other m a which means it's created an opportunity for what i'm calling the kind of mid-market mid-tier platform companies some of them are platform conglomerates some of them are now morphing themselves into platform conglomerates by using m a um, so i've got five examples in here uh, salesforce acquiring slack we've talked about that before on the show i love this deal it's a phenomenal deal salesforce you know, in the 200, 200 to 250 billion market cap, they're one of the larger of my SUS companies, which stands for uh, Salesforce, Spotify, Etsy, Uber, and Square. Now, they're not all platform companies yet, which I'll get to, but those are my SUS stocks. There could be other mid market companies that are able to use MA and um, use that as an accelerant. The, the main point here is, I think you look over the next, say, three to five years of growth, I think you're going to see growth-wise, I think you're going to see these mid-market platform companies that are able to use M&A effectively outpace the large tech monopolies, the FAMGAs, because, because one group, the former group, the mid-market, is able to use M&A and the latter group, the large tech monopolies, are really not able to use M&A like they were, certainly like they were using it prior. And that has a big impact on growth. And how are these companies valued? Oh, yeah, that's right. They're valued on growth. So that's a big problem for these large tech monopolies. M&A is such a huge force for growth. And that has really been handicapped. Not necessarily completely shut down, but absolutely handicapped. Salesforce acquiring Slack, great example. Spotify trying to become a platform and doing that through podcasting. I've talked about this many times on the show. They are not, they've, they're doing smaller M&A. They're buying like smaller kind of podcasting tech kind of companies. We use some of these companies. I think one of them is called Anchor, for example. Uh, so they're, they're kind of spending smaller money there. It's not big headline Slack acquisition kind of money or after pay kind of acquisition money like with Square I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, but they're also putting a lot of money into getting key talent like a Joe Rogan. So and, and that's what we call this kind of marquee user acquisition strategy. It's one of our seven ways to solve chicken and egg problem. So Spotify really core business is not platform, but they're trying to become a platform business and getting into podcasting in a very big way, which I love as a, as a strategic decision for them. Another one we've talked about on the show, Etsy acquiring Depop, 
and this ELO 7 in Brazil. Love these deals. Talked about it many times before. Perfect example. This is Depop was a multi-billion dollar acquisition. Perfect example of uh, mid-market Etsy becoming platform conglomerate using M&A as a huge growth accelerant. Uber acquiring Drizzly. I like it. Um, getting into another space, alcohol delivery. Transplace, I don't love as much. I think it's a little bit more of a check down kind of deal, but sure, for their freight business, yeah, it's nice. I don't think it's a disruptive, game-changing kind of deal. I think it more so lets uh, Dara tell Wall Street that Uber freight is profitable and take some heat off of him. But still, using M&A as a mechanism to accelerate what they're trying to do uh, with their overall strategy. Last one here I want to dig a little bit deeper into because I, I really, really like this. Um, this is Square buying Afterpay. Square actually not in plat. Not considered a platform company. That might, might be a little bit of a head scratcher. But when you actually look at the platform businesses that Square has, Square Cash really being, I'd say, the largest one by just volume and throughput, the revenue that thing spins off does not make Square a platform by our criteria for Plat. They have their merchant business, the Square Readers. They really pioneered that whole industry. They have their point of sale business, right? So they're doing lending to merchants, right? They're, they're doing a lot of great things. Caveat, besides buying Title, So Title is not a great example of mid-market tech companies using M&A as a growth initiative, that title acquisition was full on crazy. And I absolutely do not support it. So that is not in this article. But yes, it does unfortunately fit my ethos of these companies using M&A. Yikes. Anyway, the Afterpay acquisition is legitimately a great acquisition. I love the deal. And here's why I love the deal. Because I think just like just like what Spotify is doing to try and kind of use m and I think as a catalyst to really close the loop on their evolution to be a, a true platform business. In the same way or in a similar way, I think this Afterpay deal is a great mechanism for Square to close the loop on their platform evolution. And the reason why is this. When you look at Ant Financial in China, <laughs> botched IPO, thanks to Jack Ma saying, some words about the regulators, which ticked off the regulators, and then you got reconditioning for a month. But anyway, I digress. Um, the real magic of Ant Financial was their ability to, to revolutionize in-person payments, right? In-store payments. And there was no real credit card presence in China. It was China. And so... They're the masters of protectionism. They didn't let that stuff into the country. So you had a vacuum. And it wasn't even very sophisticated. Like, you know, I would argue paying with a QR code versus swiping a credit card. Yeah, the latter is actually an easier, better, more seamless experience. I get points back, right? Like the credit card companies have a very sticky core transaction. Um, that's why they're literally everywhere but China. And instead, Ant Financial came in with QR codes. Um, but be, more so because there was a vacuum. There was no incumbent. There was no, the, the existing consumer behavior, yeah, doing QR codes with your phone was actually a huge, much, much more delightful consumer experience. So Ant Financial QR code payments took off like wildfire. How does Square Cash, right? The initial idea with Square Cash was to say, hey, if I've got all these merchants using a Square point of sale, you know, they got the fob, how can I, how can I close the link between saying, hey, consumer, you're in this store. Hey, merchant, you're using our point of sale system. Let's help these two people, the merchant and the consumer transact using Square. Square on the consumer side, Square on the producer side, magic, Right. Um, where like originally Square Cash was saying, I'm going to use your GPS. I'm going to show the merchant, 
hey, these consumers are in your store. I'm going to be able to give them information about the about the shopper, right? Because if you had the app, you could do all this intelligence. You could do much better matchmaking and customer service and loyalty and all these really cool things, right? It never happened. It never really stuck. They were never able to really complete that core transaction, which is also why Square never really fulfilled its ethos as a platform company. It wasn't able to really connect consumer and producer. Had really good producer, still does, merchant point of sale tech. And it has now Square Cash, which is more of like a Venmo competitor doing very well. Um, but that's just peer to peer sending money back and forth. Very much harder to monetize that. Enter Afterpay. And I think this is the mechanism that Square can use to thread the needle to displace the in-person buying experience of using a credit card. And that's this buy now, pay later functionality. And if you actually go look, um, Klarna is another big competitor. They're actually a European player, you know, out of Europe, Klarna, big company, buy now, pay later. Um, you go to, like I was buying makeup for my wife from Sephora, Klarna sticker. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Seems like a really clunky process. Like, why am I going to do buy now, pay later on like, I don't know, $100 of makeup or whatever it was. I don't know. Like, are you going to run my credit? How is that going to work? Why am I going to do installments on a Sephora purchase? Didn't it just, it wasn't seamless. It wasn't baked into the process, right? Like it just seemed like a lot of hoops for not that much marginal benefit. Now though, if you can have an integrated experience with Afterpay, giving you similar buy now, pay later functionality, and then you bake that into the Square Cash app, right? See where I'm going with this? And then you got you already got all these merchants that are using Square Point of Sale and the dongle tech. I think that gives you put all that together, you mash it up. If they execute this and they integrate it properly, you mash it all together. I think you've got a viable mechanism for Square to close the loop on that in-store payment core transaction. And I think that could launch them. Yeah, it was a lot of money, like $30 billion to go, to go buy Afterpay. But I think that's the real unlock here for Square is to bring that in stores, to close the loop on this. Yes, they can obviously help bring this more e-commerce, you know, buying digitally online and, and kind of um, using all of that uh, linkage. But, but that to me is the big unlock. That's kind of the, the missing link in Square's platform evolution. I think this Afterpay deal could give them that magic sauce to help kind of do that, right? Because then you say, yeah, if I have the Square Cash app, you know, which a bunch of people now have. I get the same value, right? What does a credit card let you do? It gives you some points and it lets you string out your payments, right? Um, gives you an extra 30 days, whatever, to, you know, to pay the bill. You can get like pretty close to that value prop from Square. And now you got the merchants there. I think there's a real nice play here for them to do that. If they do do that, right? Like Square would never be able to do that organically. Go launch a buy now, pay later business of scale and then try to close the loop on this, right? It just it would take too long. Um, certainly with the number of ayahuasca trips that Jack Dorsey is going on, that guy does not have that much time. Got to move, man. Um, Square, $100, $110 billion market cap. They pull this off. This company is going through the roof uh, in terms of value. So I love it. I hope Jack Dorsey is not the one really leading the charge of the integration. Um, but... I do love the play strategically. Let's see if they can execute and integrate, which is very hard to do. Last topic. We got an Aussie down. Nothing to do with Australia. Nothing to do with Aussie Osborne. Aussie media. Um, or do we? So if you've been following or hearing about this whole thing with Aussie media, Aussie media was going to be like this disruptive media company take down like I don't know, Wall Street Journal or whatever, you know, boom, this new media company. They have uh, Aussie Fest, I think, uh, which they got sued for by Sharon Osborne. That I think they have Ozfest, you know, for Ozzy Osborne, 
These guys have Aussie Fest. Yeah, some, something. It's close. She sued them. Is this actually a great example of, of the games that this company plays? She sues them. They settle with her. They give her stock in the company. CEO of Aussie Media now tells people that Sharon Osborne is an investor in the company. That's this whole thing in a nutshell. Is it technically true? Maybe. Is it, but is it really true? No, it's not true. That's just the tip of the iceberg, mind you. There's this New York Times article where they broke the story. Goldman Sachs, Ozzy Media, and a $40 million conference call gone wrong. Ozzy Media has now raised total of uh, over $80 million. Some of that's PPP money. They got 3.75 million PPP money. That's nice. It's a lot of money. A lot of PPP money. Their last fundraise, uh, this was in the fall of 2019. They raised, they had a $159 million post money valuation. They raised $35 million. The chairman of the board and their lead investor is this guy named Mark Lazary, um, owner of the Milwaukee Bucks, billionaire, super well-to-do investor, big name, right? Uh, Steve Jobs' wife, widow, invested in this thing. You had uh, the, the big German media conglomerate, Axel Springer, the founder of GSV Capital, big hedge fund, a big uh, VC fund out of Silicon Valley, this guy named Michael Moe. He led their, their seed round. Hey, big names attached to this thing. So they're trying to raise $40 million from Goldman Sachs. <laughs> um, they're supposed to do like a video call oh, and then they say, oh, we have technical difficulties. Let's switch over to a voice call. You know, so when you're raising this money with investors, you do, um, you do um, as the investor, you do a lot of diligence. And so one of the points of diligence, uh, Ozzy was saying, here, go talk to YouTube. Here's this executive at YouTube. He can vouch for how amazing Ozzy Media is, how much they love us and how much we're growing and all these wonderful things which is why you should give us $40 million, Goldman Sachs, right? Goldman Sachs is on the call, um, listening to this person from YouTube, but it sounds kind of weird. They think, you know, I don't know, it doesn't really sound, like the voice seems altered. I don't know, and, and like, it seems weird, right? Technical difficulties, then the guy's voice doesn't sound, you know, true. So they emailed the assistant of the person at Google, at YouTube. And then the assistant gets back to Goldman. And so if Goldman's emailing you saying, hey, we just spoke to you on the phone, you know, kind of checking this out. Um, and so if Goldman emails you at YouTube, you're like, whoa, 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 Goldman. Like, we never had this call. This guy at YouTube, uh, he never had this call. This guy, Mr. Piper, Alex Piper, the head of unscripted programming for YouTube originals. Look at this scam artist. He was running late and apologized to the Goldman Sachs team, saying he'd had trouble logging onto Zoom, and he suggested that the meeting be moved to a conference call. Once everyone had made the switch to an old-fashioned conference call, the guests told the bankers they'd been wanting to hear. Ozzy was a great success. So they reached out to YouTube. When YouTube learned that someone had apparently impersonated one of their executives, its security team started an investigation, and here we go. So turns out, Samir Rao, the co-founder and chief operating officer of Ozzy, was impersonating this YouTube executive. Mr. Rao worked at Goldman Sachs and went to Harvard. The CEO, Mr. Watson, also worked at Goldman Sachs McKinsey and went to Harvard. He went to Stanford Law School. They got these big to-do investors, strategic investors, big, big billionaire investors. And the co-founder is impersonating YouTube. Do you think that Mr. Watson, what's his first name? I don't like calling him Carlos. Do you think Carlos knew that his co founder, Samir, was doing this? Hmm. Absolutely. But Carlos will say no, he had no idea, and that Samir has uh, mental health issues. Carlos attributed the incident. 
<laughs> Attributed the incident to a mental health crisis. Samir is a valued colleague and a close friend. I'm proud that we stood by him while he struggled. And we're all glad to see him now thriving again because he was not fired, by the way. Um, Mr. Rao took off time from work and is now back at Ozzy. Weird. Kind of uh, weird. Mark Lazary, poor guy, hedge fund manager, chairman of the Aussie board, said in a statement, the board was made aware of the incident and we fully support the way it was handled. The incident was an unfortunate one-time event. And Carlos and his team showed the kind of compassion we would all want if any of us face a difficult situation in our own lives. Absolutely not. This guy should have been fired in two seconds. You can support him without him being an employee. This guy's a co-founder of the firm. What kind of example does that set to your employees about integrity and like any shred of value system in this company? How is Mark Lazary vouching for this and putting his name behind this? Now, everything boiled over. Not to mention Lion Tree had money in this thing. There are big to do boutique uh, investment bank in the media industry. This is a media focused TMT investment bank. Um, huge names putting money into this thing. And it's a sham. It's an outright sham. Now, it gets crazier. So then this whole thing comes out, New York Times, like a week later, boom. NPR, Ozzy shuts down as problems mount for the media company. An email statement from Friday uh, from Ozzy Media's board called it a company with many world-class journalists. It is with the heaviest of hearts that we must announce today that we are closing Ozzy's doors. Okay, so it's closing. Or is it? Joining us now exclusively, Carlos Watson, Ozzy Media's CEO. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for coming in. Let's let's start with the status of Ozzy as we sit right now. Reports that the company shut down on Friday. Is that true? Is, it, is the company shut down or are you still open for business? You know, we're going to open for business. So uh, we're making news today. Uh, this is our Lazarus moment, if you will. This is our Tylenol moment. Um, last week was traumatic. It was difficult. Um, heartbreaking in many ways. And at the end of the week, we did suspend operations with a plan to wind down. But as we spent time over the weekend, we talked to advertising partners. We talked to some of our readers, some of our viewers, our listeners, our investors. I think Ozzy is part of this moment. And it's not going to be easy. Um, but I think what we do with newsletters, what we do with TV shows, original TV shows, podcasts, and more, I think has a place. So, like... The board, clearly, clearly the board is not on board with this, right? Because that statement was from the board saying, yeah, we're shutting this thing down. Now the CEO, there, I guarantee Carlos did not want to shut this thing down. The board wanted to shut it down. I guarantee you're going to see board members resigning um, if they haven't already, but maybe it's just not publicized. Carlos is going forward with this thing. The guy is an absolute madman. Let's talk about this phone call. I mean, did, did you know that, that your partner, the co-founder of this company, was going to impersonate a, a YouTube executive on a, on a call? Yeah, no. And it's, it, it's sad and it's, um, it's difficult. It was wrong. Um, obviously, they figured it out very quickly. But and here's the thing. Someone would wonder, perhaps, I mean, you, you're on a call with Goldman Sachs. You're trying to score $40 million in funding. Why, why were you not on the call and how did you not have any knowledge of, of the call? You know, part of the fundraising process, you end up talking to a lot of people, okay. and I'm not on every call. And there are lots of these reference calls that happen. They, I think, probably ended up talking to three, four, maybe five uh, of our references. They also talked to members of the team. They talked to some of our other investors. And so there are a fair number of things that are involved, and you're not a part of all of them. But over a three-month period of time, I spent a lot of time with him as part of the process. As you know, there, there could be some serious legal implications yes. with regards to, to that call. Have yeah. you heard from the FBI? Have you heard from law enforcement at this point? I, I definitely haven't. Okay. So a couple things in that. One, the, uh, Carlos knows this uh, guy interviewing him, right? So he's, he's, yeah, he's asking him a follow-up question, but I would have not let this guy off. I would have kept drilling him, right? Why did you not fire Samir? What kind of example does that show to your employees? What kind of values do you even say that you purport to have, which clearly you don't if you kept this guy on payroll? How in God's name did you not understand? How, this is not a one-off incident. This kind of stuff 
does not happen one time. This is something that you see. How are you blind to this, right? Like, there's no way that this, I mean, they're coordinating reference calls with Goldman Sachs. You don't think as a CEO, you're going to have an I oh, like, oh, so are they talking to you too? What are we doing with the reference call? Where's that at, co-founder? Like, right? Like, there was never any reference call set up with YouTube. There's so many ways that this story breaks down. This guy's lying. Now, that's point one. Point two is the unjust application of the law in this country. FBI probing Aussie media after co-founder allegedly impersonated YouTube executive. Okay. This does not go far enough. FBI probing. FBI probing. You impersonated an executive while trying to raise money. This is securities of fraud to the umpteenth level. You should have the federal government shutting down the business. If this was a crypto company doing this, impersonating, let's say, an executive from Coinbase or so- something, I don't know. Um, that company would be shut down. The executives would be hauled off in handcuffs. They'd be in jail in about four hours. But no, the FBI is probing this, right? When I Google this, right? Hey, uh, Aussie media under investigation. It says the board is launching an investigation and that's it. Now under FBI, this isn't just an FBI. This is an SEC. They have violated so many laws. This isn't just a probe. This is my point on our government agencies are interpreting violations of the law and prioritizing them in an unequal fashion, right? Lady Justice, she's blind, right? She holds the scales. She's blindfolded. Lady Justice is no longer blindfolded in this country. We have an unequal application of the law. And clearly, this company, Ozzy Media, has some kind of aura around it with its investors, with, you know, the people on the board, with, you know, all the things around them that, you know, oh, well, yeah, you know, if they want to keep operating, yeah, let's just investigate Samir. FBI is investigating Samir. What about the whole company? It's 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 honestly com- complete uh, malarkey. That's the word I'll use to, in an in ode to our Australian brethren. This also goes to support the fact that <clears throat> you got to diligence these companies. And, and the New York Times article says, you know, how do you know between someone hyping up the sales and, and you know, being a good hype man like Elon at Tesla and, and just being straight fraudulent like Theranos? And the answer is good diligence. And you see this so often now in all these tech companies is how do you really know who's got it and who doesn't? A little plug for Applico. That's what we do. Uh, unfortunately for Lion Tree, which is a media investment bank, how they did not see through this and really do the proper diligence, maybe just, you know, it was Mark Lazary, you had Axel in there and you had, you know, like they kind of maybe like those guys were leading the round. Uh, Mark Lazary is a hedge fund, right? I mean, they're supposed to do diligence, right? You know, what, what Goldman Sachs caught was good on Goldman Sachs for catching it, but I think that was just the tip of the iceberg. And, and that friendly uh, interview that, that Carlos did on uh, whatever this is, like on the Today Show, I guess. Um, you know, they ask him about basically buying junk traffic. And then, you know, because the way, the way uh, Aussie Media and all these, all these content publication sites make money is they charge advertisers, right? So you charge them for eyeballs coming in. So if you buy junk traffic coming in and you get eyeballs, but you pay five, you know, a cent, uh, a, a one cent CPM, but then you charge your advertisers 10 cents CPM, you just made nine cents, right? Like you can play kind of these games of arbitrage, eyeball arbitrage. And that's the biggest gripe of the large tech content platform monopolies is giving visibility and transparency to advertisers to actually see, hey, how many eyeballs did I get? How many clicks did I get? Were these just bots? 
that were running through and clicking on things and I paid for those? Like, how do I actually see this was real engagement, real quality engagement? That's why companies like Comscore and these independent ratings agencies have a business is to try and bring that. So when you look at the Comscore numbers versus Ozzy's numbers, there's huge discrepancies, which they ask him about. But the problem is in these interviews, they ask him one question and then he's got a scripted answer and then they just keep moving. You got to ask follow up questions. You want to interview employees and, and really ask employees tough questions? It's about the follow up questions. Don't give me one follow up. I want two. I want three follow ups. How do you handle the unscripted questions, the pressing? Hey, well, what about this? Hey, what about that? That's what a real interview is, not these layup interviews by former friends and colleagues and, <clears throat> and then getting this angel treatment from the authorities for a clear scam sham of a company defrauding investors. Sad to see all around. I don't, I don't even understand. I mean, why, why the guy keeps on with it, but I don't know who's staying at this company. Yikes. That's it for us on Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll talk to you soon.